Good morning, and welcome to this online worship service with the Old Presbyterian Meeting House in Alexandria, Virginia. Wherever you are, we are glad that you are with us today as we worship God and seek God's will for our lives. The Lord be with you. Let us worship God together. As one body, we have many members, each uniquely gifted. We who are many are one body in Christ. Prophets and poets, thinkers and teachers, artists and advocates, consolers and caregivers. We who are many are one body in Christ. With thanksgiving, we offer our varied gifts in service to Christ who makes us one. Let us glorify the Lord. Friends, Christ is our sure foundation, binding all the church in one. Even as we worship in our many homes, we know we are the church together, building together on Christ's foundation of love and faith. But we also know that week in and week out, we fall short in following Christ's ways. So we come together here in this sacred space and time together 
to confess our sins before God and before one another, knowing that God's mercy is from everlasting to everlasting. Let us join together in prayer. We call you the Son of the living God, but we do not trust you to be at work in our world. You are the Messiah who delivers us from death to life, but we doubt your power to transform our lives. We profess you are the Christ, the Lord of our lives, but our attention often wanders and our loyalty is tested. Forgive us, we pray, and help us not only to proclaim you, but to follow your way of justice and peace. Hear now the prayers we bring to you in silence. The mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. And so I declare to you in the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. And may the God of mercy who forgives you all of your sins, strengthen you in all goodness and empower you with the Holy Spirit to live a life worthy of your calling. Amen. Today's scripture reading comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 16, verses 13 through 20. Listen for the word of God. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, but others Elijah and still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. 
And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he sternly ordered the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Hello, thank you for joining us for Time with Children. We're the Cuccinelli family. I'm James. If you've been in the church since the 70s, you might call me Jamie when I joined the church as a young kid. Carrie and I got married in 2003, and Leo and David came shortly thereafter. Okay, boys, I have some questions for you about superheroes. A lot of superheroes have two different names, right? Yeah. They have their normal name, and then they have their superhero name. For example, what's the normal name of Spider-Man? Peter Parker. How about Batman? Bruce Wayne. How about Black Panther? T'Challa. And Captain Marvel? Carol Danvers. What about Iron Man? Tony Stark. You really know your superheroes. How do you know so much about them? Because we have watched the movies and heard stories from friends. Even though you guys know both names of those superheroes, most of the people who are in the stories do not know both names of the superheroes. Instead, it's only the people who are closest to the characters who know both of their names, who truly know who the superheroes are. In today's scripture story, something like this happens with Jesus and his disciples. Jesus asked his disciples who other people say Jesus is, and there are lots of different answers, answers that are incorrect. So then Jesus asked his disciples who they think he is. Peter says, you are the Messiah and the, the son of the living God. And Jesus says, you are right. And because you know who I am, you will help others know who I am. The reason Peter and other disciples know who Jesus really is, and others didn't, is because they were paying close attention to Jesus. Peter is a student of Jesus. He follows Jesus wherever Jesus goes. He's watching, learning, and listening to Jesus. Because he does this, he learns both of Jesus' names. He knows Jesus is teacher, and he knows Jesus the Messiah. And guess what? What? We can know Jesus the same way Peter does. We can follow Jesus and learn from him. We do that in the same way you learned about your favorite superheroes, by reading, discussing, and paying attention to all the stories in the Bible about Jesus. This is one of the reasons we talk about Jesus in the stories when we're in worship and in Sunday school. It's important to continue to read, discuss, and pay attention to the stories about Jesus. When we learn more about Jesus, the more we can teach and share with others all about Jesus and God's love, just like Peter did. And that's the good news for today. Let us pray. Dear God, help us learn all that we can about Jesus and your love, and help us share that love with everyone we meet. Amen. May God be with you there. May God be with us here. May, May God, God be, be with, with everyone, everyone everywhere. everywhere. Amen. Amen. Who do you say that the Son of Man is? This may be the most important question you and I will ever be asked. Our answers determine how we live and act, how we treat other people, and how we care for the earth. Our answers reveal what we stand for and on what or who we are willing to stake our faith. Like it or not, this question brings us to one of those uncomfortable, but oh so necessary, come to Jesus moments. I want you to take some time to imagine Jesus walking into the crowd of protesters and riot police, accompanied by various political and military leaders gathered around Lafayette Square, and asking everyone there, who do you say that I am? Imagine Jesus walking up to people in Portland, Chicago, Louisville, and Charlottesville, and asking everyone on the streets of those cities, who do you say that I am?
course, it is not enough to imagine Jesus asking others this question. We have to imagine Jesus asking us this question and then taking him seriously enough to answer him truthfully. To paraphrase Caroline Lewis, there can be no more playing it safe, no more silence, no more hiding behind vague theological commitments, no more letters or petitions or statements alone. It is not just what the church or its pastors say that counts, but what you say. Questions of identity are at the center of the Gospels. And as Eric Barreto points out, the Gospel writers are not just interested in correctly defining who Jesus is, but also in shaping a community of people molded in light of his actions and teachings. And so says Barreto, these questions of identity are not just matters of definition, but of formation, not just doctrine, but discipleship. In other words, our beliefs are meant to inform and shape our lives. To acknowledge Jesus as our Lord and our Savior is to follow his way, speak his truth, and live his kind of life. Perhaps now you can understand why I said this question brings about a come to Jesus moment. And if Jesus's question doesn't cause you to sit up and take notice, well, then I'm not sure what will. It bears noting that Jesus asked this question in Caesarea Philippi, a city situated some 30 miles north of the Sea of Galilee. It was near a trade route connecting Tyre in the west to Damascus in the northeast. A nearby cave housed a great spring that fed one of the sources of the Jordan River. That particular cave had long served as a sanctuary dedicated to the Greek god Pan. Greek inscriptions and niches carved into the rock suggest dedications to other pagan gods as well. And there were other signs of power and authority on display in that area. According to historians, some 20 years or so before Jesus' birth, Herod the Great had built a temple near the cave in honor of Caesar Augustus. And by the time Jesus and his disciples visited that region, Caesarea Philippi had been put under the authority of one of Herod's sons, Philip the Tetrarch, who made it the administrative center of his government. And by the time the Gospel of Matthew was written, people were keenly aware that this was the city where the Roman commander returned with his troops after destroying Jerusalem in 70 CE. Thus, as one commentator notes, Jesus' question, who do you say that I am, hangs in the air at the intersection of economic trade, religion, and the power of the empire. It is a question not simply about Jesus' identity, as if getting the titles right would earn somebody an A on the Messianic quiz. No, it's a question of allegiance. In what or who, in whom will the followers of Jesus place their trust? Will it be in the privileges deriving from access to power and wealth? Will it be in the worship of a prevailing culture's latest idols? Will it be in allegiance to the dominant power of earthly rulers? Or will they trust Jesus, the one who reveals the mercy and justice of the living God? Well, I wonder if we can hear these questions as being addressed not just to Jesus' first disciples, but to us. I wonder if we can understand that like the first disciples, we must decide in what or in whom we will place our trust. I fear many of us 
cannot. Out of all the disciples, it is Peter who steps up and speaks out. He figures out right then and there what he believes, and then he says it out loud. If we can hear Jesus' question as being addressed to us, if we can understand that we must decide in what or in whom we will place our trust, then, like Peter, we must answer the question. And we must do so now, in this moment, when so much is at stake. As Lewis puts it, Hearing the question means answering the question, not waiting to weigh the evidence, not waiting to decide what's the best side to be on, not waiting to leverage the best possible outcomes for ourselves. For as Martin Luther King pointed out almost 50 years ago, too many of us have been more cautious than courageous and have remained silent behind the anesthetizing security of our stained glass windows. Peter is the first person to acknowledge Jesus as the long-awaited Messiah, the Son of the living God. As Matthew tells it, Peter's confession is in stark contrast to conventional thinking. Most people, we are told, see Jesus as simply another John the Baptist or Elijah or Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. Peter seems to be the only one who gets it, but he doesn't get it by himself. Jesus says he gets it from God. And then Jesus blesses Peter for stepping up and speaking out. And not only that, with an interesting play on words, Jesus calls Peter, Petros, a rock, Petra, on whom he promises to build his church. Parenthetically, it is interesting to note that Matthew is the only gospel writer to use the word church. Something to keep in mind as we contemplate what it means for us and other church members to bind and loose things on earth. But that's best left for another sermon. For now, I think it is enough to know that Jesus' promise to build his church on Peter is not given to him as a reward for his faith, but because there was and there still is a need for the church to be his body at work in the world. And Jesus' blessing of Peter is likewise not given for Peter's personal benefit, but so that he and other members of his church could be a source of blessing for others. To paraphrase Lewis, <clears throat> Jesus does not say he will build his church on Peter because he got the right answer, but because Peter spoke up. According to Jesus, the church is not the church when it stays silent. When people's lives are at stake, cautious silence is not an option. And make no mistake about it, people's lives are at stake right now. Jesus knew this. Lives are at stake when Jesus' church cannot figure out how to make bold stands and then act them out. As Peter reminds us, Jesus is the son of the living God, the word made flesh who suffers alongside of us, who loves us enough to take a stand and to act on it, knowing full well where that will lead him, to a cross. I believe this son of the living God loves all people equally. I believe this son of the living God wants us to do the same. I believe this son of the living God wants you and wants me to take bold stands and act them out 
to step up and to speak out against the corrupt and corrupting policies of the modern empire. I believe the Son of the living God wants and expects us to bind up the things that have gone awry and to loose the things that have been kept under wraps for far too long. I believe this is our come to Jesus moment. There can be no more playing it safe, no more silence, no more excuses. May God help us to seize this moment and use it not just for our sakes, but for the sake of the world and all the people God loves. Amen. Having heard the word read and proclaimed, let us profess our faith together now using words from a declaration of faith. God sent Jesus to proclaim release to those who are bound, to announce that God's promised kingdom is at hand, to urge everyone to repent and believe the good news. The Lord is moving toward the time when the glorious liberty of the children of God will be manifest throughout the whole creation. We testify that God is at work here and now, and when people obey Christ's commission to witness to him, when they spread the good news by their words and embody it in their lives. We are called to witness to Christ spreading the good news by our words and embodying it in our lives. As each of us seeks to discern our call in the particular circumstances of our lives, I urge you to stay connected with our community of faith. This morning, join us at 11 o'clock for a special coffee hour with our choir as we learn how they've adapted in this time of pandemic. Please also take note of many opportunities detailed in the weekly egram to act for good, including advocating for those facing eviction and participating in a virtual walkathon to support Alive, a vital provider of food to those in need in Alexandria. You'll also find information on how to be added to the email list for the Meeting House's Dismantling Racism Team. And we continue to hold a weekly Bible study and a Friday gratitude gathering. And also, please don't hesitate to reach out to us if you are in need of pastoral care or help of any kind. We can't physically pass the offering plate right now, but we are still called to give of ourselves as part of our response to Christ's call to discipleship, I ask that you continue to support the church financially so that we can continue to reach out to others and work for God's kingdom here among us. Let us pray. Who do you say that I am? You are the Messiah, living God, you call us to love our neighbors as ourselves, letting go of our hurts and grievances. Hear our prayers that in place of anger and alienation, there may be peace. In place of loneliness, compassion. In place of aimlessness, direction. In place of fear, trust in you. Reconciling God, we give you thanks for your never-ending guidance through your prophets and leaders and teachers who modeled the way of love and healing and peace for the whole universe. We offer these prayers on behalf of ourselves and our neighbors who are one in the body of Christ. We pray for the hundreds of thousands of lives lost here and around the globe to this deadly coronavirus. We pray for so many in California fleeing for their lives from deadly wildfires, even as we offer thanksgiving 
for first responders and frontline workers everywhere, risking their lives to help others. May your compassion prevail. We pray for our military and their families across the world who work to guard our safety amidst terrorism and war. May your peace prevail. We pray for our neighbors across the nation who protest peacefully amidst chaos in our government and violence in the streets. May your justice prevail. Loving God, you who hear the cries of those in need, wrap loving arms around all who are suffering so they might know peace and comfort and courage. Support and give courage to students and their families as so many decide how to continue their education safely. Embolden our communities and our church to make right and safe decisions about how and when to regather in person. Strengthen all of those who have fallen ill, who are recovering, who are grieving, as well as all of those whom we hold close in our hearts in the silence of these moments. Holy God, draw us near to you and teach us to follow in the steps of your Son, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, Our Father who, who art in heaven, heaven hallowed, hallowed be thy name. name. Thy, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead, lead us, us not into, into temptation, temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This is your come to Jesus moment. Therefore, I charge you to be watchful, to stand firm in your faith, to be courageous and strong, and to let all that you say and do be done in love. And so may the blessings of God come not just to you, but to all people now and forever. 
Amen. Thank you.